I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. Third people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. He won't slip on the floor. Out of here and out of there. Just like a lot of uh, wild people, we didn't. We didn't know nothing. Didn't allow you to look in no book. Absolutely. That's First Amendment right. It, I think that people are completely misinformed. It needs to be a page one rewrite. Absolutely true. To uplift those he considers at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder who are rising up. How many people in this room have ever owned a slave? That's what I thought. I was pretty naive, but that's what I thought. And if there is any doubt about it, and let me just say, I'm just afraid that I don't think you're. I don't think you're understanding that they're like they are personally offended because I want you to. I want to know that you know that they are and why they are. So I want. <laughs> why do you no, think she asked specific questions? So she should ask the question. Because they're misinformed about. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> The fact that this was normal, the fact that this was behavior that didn't really shock anybody tells you something about how deeply white supremacy has been ingrained into American culture. This is Dr. King in 1955. We must love our enemies, be good to them. This is what we must live by and we must meet hate with love. We must love our white brothers no matter what they do to us. This is Dr. King in 1967. Urban riots are a special form of violence. They are not insurrections. The rioters are not seeking to seize territory or attain control of institutions. They are mainly intended to shock the white community. Most of all, alienated from society and knowing society cherishes property above people, the rioters are shocking it by abusing property rights. That's not a speech that is brought out in Martin Luther King week either. And on the night he was killed, April 4th, 1968, he was writing a sermon that was found in the briefcase in his room at the Lorraine Motel. And this is the title of the sermon he was gonna give three days later. I think like if you ever take a history class, they tell you that this part of our history is like a shameful part and I think it should be left in the past because it's kind of irrelevant now. I don't know if y'all remember the Traveling Wilburys. Great, great band. And one of their songs had this verse and the walls came down all the way to hell and I saw them when they're standing and I saw them when they fell. Well, we have seen these monuments stand for way too long. And as I said, taking these monuments down will not feed a hungry person. It will not release anybody from jail. It will not solve the problems of race. But it is one way that we can at least begin to say we are going to deal honestly with what our past is so that we at least have a fighting chance to move forward in a way that actually makes words like justice and equality mean something instead of sounding like a soundbite that makes us feel good. So come on, family, we're all family, let's get together and take a picture. Shannon Lanier, right in front there, was 19 when he attended the controversial first ever combined Hemings-Jefferson family reunion at Monticello in 1999. Afterward, he and Jane Feldman, the photographer who took this picture, traveled the country interviewing four generations of Hemingses and Jeffersons for a book 
Jefferson's children. Are, any way you look at it, race is going to get put on the back burner. So don't say nigger, just say states' rights. Remember that as we talk about our history, because that man learned from what we have done in the past. People think that the South lost the Civil War. They lost the war, but they won the peace. And they won it by rewriting the history of our country. And that's what I'd like to talk about this evening some. Well, <laughs> well if, if we want to talk about how states' rights and how all this stuff, you want to have freedom in what you believe in, right? Okay, like specifically though. Specifically, okay. So, not everyone is entitled to health care, but yet we think that everyone is entitled to health care. Not everyone is entitled to slavery because we got rid of that, right? What? Hold on. Here, it's the same thing. You back in the south, back in the south, southerners, back in the south, southerners thought. Back in the south, southerners thought that slavery was their right. Now we think that health care is our right. So you're likening slavery to Obamacare. Well, we're talking about it's a city. We're talking about we're talking about, we're talking about big government and we're talking about states' rights. You can compare the two. <laughs> no one will expect you to be this forthright. So now here's where you hit him with the rope a dope. Ask them, should this flag come down because it represents a racist government? These liberal douchebags will predictably say yes. Yes, the South flag was based on racism and this flag was based on all men who were created equal. So this is a good flag. Well, this flag was written on a bad check. The all men created equal check, American people have not been able to cash. At least this flag was honest. Slavery existed under this flag too, actually a lot longer than it existed under this one. And the North isn't exactly a colorblind utopia today either. Just keep talking openly and honestly about history and racism in America. These BuzzFeed reading pussies might counter with the Nazi flag versus the German flag argument. They might say the Germans did up this one-off Nazi racism thing and put the old German flag on ice so now they can fly the German flag still and that this flag was just used for a racist regime. Which coincidentally, both flags were uh, designed by Germans. Totally unrelated. Okay, this flag wanted to end slavery and this one didn't. The official policy of this flag, the good flag, until 1920, 40 years after the Civil War, was that these people needed to move, be re-educated, taught to be white, or taught to be dead. That seems kind of racist. <laughs> okay, if we're the United States, then why do people fly the flag of a group of people that betrayed us and tried to leave? Secondly, we're not saying that you can't fly it. We're asking you to think before you do it and understand that people might be offended. And, as you may say that you have the right to fly the Confederate flag, well, go ahead. We also have the right to burn it. The real revolution begins at Stanford University. I have a post box there, post box S, which is the same as Shockley and Stanford. I will try to supply more information, and I'm sure Dr. Welsing will say what she can do about making, uh, telling people how to reach her pamphlet. No. But my uh, principal point, uh, Mr. Brown, is uh, not so much a theory of black-white differences, but is summed up in one word, which is the theme of my appearance on your program and my efforts, and the word is dysgenics. And dysgenics means effectively downbreeding, retrogressive evolution. And I fear that this is worst for the black community, and I particularly welcome an opportunity to appear on Black Journal just for these reasons. And let me say also, our skin is not an, is an organ. It does not think, it does not formulate ideas, it is merely the genetic result of our parents. How do you respond to that? If I really had those, I don't think I would be here this evening. Our ability to use our brain and reason in a free society, such as in America, is why we have overturned the blight and the negative aftermath of racism that began with colonial slavery. I feel that uh, what I'm engaged in is a demand for diagnosis, and I'd like to say some more about this chart, which we'll, we'll come to probably later, which shows 
the disproportionate rates of reproduction for the least effective elements of the black community. I'd like to say more about that than we should in just this brief introduction. Several years ago, I heard people on TV saying this was one of the greatest movies ever made in the history of American film. And look at the advertisement, a stupendous motion picture employing the services of 18,000 people, accompanied by a symphony orchestra of 40. Film and art does give you an idea of where a country is and what a culture values. And this was one of the greatest hits of American culture at the time. How great? Well, it was three years in production. And many people don't know that this was the first movie that was ever filmed in the White House. Woodrow Wilson had this film shown in the White House. And the film, it didn't have any black actors, of course. They just put blackface on white actors to play the role of the evil black scourge. This is what President Woodrow Wilson had to say. The white aroused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. That is the President of the United States. And he is speaking to a populace in America that's saying, we get it. For the last few years, I've had this sense that everything I learned as a kid about how America's government works is completely wrong. Which means a scientific analysis of racial differences. And I, uh, basically, I have a faith that reason is a good thing. And I feel, uh, as you do about the First Amendment, but maybe with a slightly different emphasis. I think the really important thing about the First Amendment is it is a way of guaranteeing a high likelihood the truth will emerge as a result of conflict, conflicting ideas being expressed and I have a thesis and a basic belief the truth is a good thing and will be of benefit to man. You white folks have, have either one of two choices. Give me my damn freedom or kill me. I'm going to say that if there were not a basic difference and uh, intellectual capacity in the past, there probably will be a basic difference between black and white intellectual capacity in the future simply because of the reproduction patterns. And these are Census Bureau data, and this is the most threatening aspect. And what it indicates is that for the black women of the lowest intellectual social class, uh, which are rural farm women, generally the education is least, the average number of children is 5.4. For women with um, <clears throat> college degrees, it's 1.9. And um, so this is definitely unfavorable. It is, it is reproducing far more at the bottom end and not enough to keep even at the top end. Dr. Shockley, can For you whites, uh, let me just finish uh -huh. this. For whites, the numbers are also in this direction, but nowhere nearly as, uh, as severe. You know, from a child up, I always, at first, I wanted to be white, you know, because my family was 20 of us, six girls and 14 boys. We would make 50 and 60 bales of cotton, gather all that cotton, and we wouldn't have food in the wintertime. So I figured then the white people must be right. But as I got older, I said, no, it's something wrong. And if I ever get a chance, I'm going to do something about it. My community is the larger American community, a community built of law-abiding citizens who want to make sure that they can raise their children and their families in a country that they recognize, in a country that is run by radicals, in a country that is free, radical individuals and socialists screaming and demanding justice and setting fires and rioting and looting businesses. Jesus Christ. What, 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 what? Another damn. Read the note, not read it. Warning, do not inform police. Learn your weapon and wait for instructions. Learn your weapon and wait for instructions. Warning, do not inform police. Freedom is near. Hey. Hey. Oh. The Watts want race war. Kill them. Yo, boo. We gonna be free. Bitch, I am free. I've been free. 
Shoot your young ass up. You don't know nothing about this. This is some old jailhouse shit. I guess I'm now I'm a violate my parole and be a repeat offender. Racist policeman. Uh, numerous other things here. If you want me to mention them, we'll say here. Now we've got to put the get these four-legged and two-legged beasts. We know none of them of the brothers and sisters are going to stand for this dog business. Well, what's the motive behind this sort of? Uh, what's the motive behind this sort of propaganda, Mr. Kovaleski? I'll tell you what it is: to stir up the hostility between the police and the members of the minority group. You saw two perfect examples here tonight of why there is hostility toward the police. Just take one good long look at Reverend Clee when he says that we are the enemy, that we are the invader. And he, this is the man that says here that white policemen are the ones who are enforcing the laws for the white power structure. Let what me is ask Reverend Clee going to do? Well, well, shut up! This is the uprising Rise my ass. Ain't nobody asked me shit. Anytime a black person is uh, brutalized by the police, he goes into court and he's arrested for assault and battery. Now, the basic issue is so simple and nobody will even touch it because you're afraid to touch it. You are deliberately trying to evade the issue. Everybody is trying to... Consequently, we are asking for these rifles. We do not... We want to prevent trouble. We're not asking... They said we're out here trying to kill black people. We're trying to save everybody's people. We're not out here to kill anybody. And we need some defense. I think that the, the people have a demand for protection of property in their life. We're not out here to kill people. Before. But I've always wanted a little house in the country with the big apple tree in the front yard. What? You need to be thinking about three hots in a cot. That'll be more like it. That's if we didn't get killed, which we would. Executive Secretary of the NAACP in the city of Detroit condemns the police because they didn't put force into the riot area soon enough. Now, do they want force or don't they want force? I also hear about this high-powered rifle and so forth. In this same book, it tells you how they do it in the other countries. In the other countries, they arm their police riot squads with machine guns. They have special... Uh, lead capes in England and all over the world. They've given their police the tools to do the job. Now, the people have to make their mind up. Now, let's do they ask... want riots? Let me... Take us home. Go! Oh, this is the uprising. Hand over your watch and your house. <laughs> you all be like a house jacket. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to interrupt you for just a minute to ask uh, Dr. Reese, uh, in view of the fact that Detroit is a very familiar neighborhood to him, his headquarters are in Ann Arbor, uh, about this in terms of, of weapons, uh, and then I want to go uh, for, a, for a reaction to Dr. Poussant about this whole issue of, of uh, lethal weapons and non-lethal weapons. Uh, do, they, do they achieve any, any salubrious objective? I doubt whether an armed police in the sense of the stoner rifle is what we want in a democratic society. We'll keep this space open. This is the last stronghold for civil discourse. After this shit, it's just rat a tat 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 For white people. So the average black man ain't got nothing to lose by anything that he does. And this is what the white man better understand. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Simple. As A, B, C. Or as one, two, three, anywhere you go. There's no need to ask me why are these black people burning down these buildings out here. Hell, they got a positive answer. And people are not as dumb as people would think. With all the brilliant white psychiatrists and psychologists, you've been able to find a damn path to the moon, but you ain't been able to find one goddamn path one mile up the street. Maybe you better take time with just all this unique ability to find all these scientific discoveries that you've got to learn how to find your way into men's hearts and the men's minds. We, we'd use them first to unscramble our own mixed up minds. Honor thy mother and thy father. Even though it was my father that was whooping up on my mother's ass. See, but that's how the Lord tests us.
Then I met you. God, and you just seem so tortured and so angry. And I said to myself, now here's a man who understands pain. Who hurts as much as I do. I can just help him. Oh, I know he'll love me. And to protect me forever. Oh, baby, now God has sent us a gun and a note. Just tell me all my suffering would have been for something. What if it's a trick?